Coming up on the payoff, if you would have given me the 1990 Philadelphia 76ers roster and said, find the alcoholic, the last guy I would have selected would have been Mike Jaminski, the seventh overall pick in the 1980 NBA draft, who was in the middle of a very successful NBA career. Before Mike Krzyzewski put Duke basketball on the map, Mike Jaminski really already had. And now he is in recovery. Over a year sober, Jaminski's life completely imploded after basketball and really during COVID-19. A lot of people have not heard this. It was a conversation I had with the G-Man over the summer, and I wanted to rerun it because it's March Madness and because our guest this week bailed on us like a good alcoholic. <laughs> and I, like a good alcoholic, had no backup plan. So I go to the starting center, Mike Jaminski. But first, this guy. I mean, literally, Mike Jaminski was an All-American. This guy, consensus All-American as well. Kevin Souza. Yeah. Mike Jaminski. Yes, Pete. Hey, man, what's going on? I'm just hanging out. Um, I'm actually, I'm working. I'm working at the place where I did my um, inpatient last summer. So you're at Rebound right now? I'm at Rebound right now. No, I've, been, I've been dying yeah. to talk to you. <laughs> no problem. There's so much to get to, and I, and I, I want to talk a little basketball too just because I, I grew up a basketball fan. I grew up watching you. I remember, Mike, in, I remember when you got your ear pierced in 1990. I, I was <laughs> – You know, I was um, – like a oh god it was like a month or so after that we were on a we were on a commercial uh flight and this woman was like looking like glaring at me and she goes you know you were the reason my 11 year old son got his ear pierced (laughs) (laughs) so the sixers so the sixers were people that don't know at the start of the 1990 season you said what if you won 10 games or something you guys would get nearing and yeah, you, we and well, and the funny the story too was that um, I, for some reason I think it was because Jordan probably got his ear pierced. So Barkley got the great idea of betting the team, you know, which was a great it was a great thing, and uh, you know, so we made the bet. We wound up winning. I forget like twelve games in a row, I think. And uh, so, we, but we went away to All Star break. So I went down to uh, Atlantic City. And uh, I got my ear pierced on the on the pier down in AC at the at a place called the Piercing Pagoda. I think they're still so, around. Yeah, so I I get my ear pierced. Mahorn gets his ear pierced. Barkley comes back from the uh, from the All Star game, no ear pierced. So we drag his butt over to the um, to the mall in South Jersey and sit him down in a kiosk and get his ear pierced. <laughs> and so then we then we go out to we're going out to um, playing Golden State, and it's it's really it's not long after we had all this stuff done. So we came up with the bright idea of putting uh, band aids over our earlobes because you couldn't wear jewelry. That's right. So just just Kersey was a, a referee, and uh, we were in layup lines, and he comes over to me and he say, hey, Mike. Um, yeah, I saw that story in the paper about you guys getting your ear pierced. And I said, yeah, Jess, it's a pretty cool thing. And he said, are you wearing them right now? And I got this look on my face like, uh, yeah. And he said, well, you all have to go in the locker room and take your earrings out. So we went in, and uh, for anybody who's gotten their ear pierced knows you got to leave the stud in for like six weeks. Uh, yeah, or you ruin it. It closes back up. Yeah. It, and that's what happened after the game. So our the whole rest of the year, our trainer basically had to re-pierce our ear after every game. And you put them back in after every game? Oh yeah, absolutely. I wasn't going to go through all that and then have it closed up. <laughs> that that team, that 1996ers team, you guys, and and I won't for people that are listening because of sobriety, we'll get to that. But th- that was you, you guys flirted with with great success. That that team, you guys won the Atlantic Division. I remember the night you guys beat the Pistons at the Palace in the regular season, I think to clinch the Atlantic Division, you got into a fist fight. Um, yep. it, it was just, that team felt like they were a team of destiny. And then it just, of course, you run into Jordan and the Bulls, and that, that is what it is. 
Well, and the thing about it, um, that Derek Smith was hurt that year. And I, I still believe, you know, we, we beat Detroit. Like we, you know, we owned them for a couple of years and, but we just couldn't get to them. And, you know, the playoffs is a different deal. You never know how matchups and things like that are going to go. But, um, you know, Derek really knew how to play um, Jordan and he was a strong physical guy. And, you know, we, he just, he wasn't able to play and there was just too much Jordan, you know, it was, it was two, one, we, uh, we played them on mother's day on, uh, in, in Philly, they won the game and then wound up winning in five up in uh, Chicago. Yeah. I remember that mother's day game cause we were in it for a little while and then down the stretch, they put us away. And I got, I got upset because I had, I think I had like 24 at the end of the third quarter. And I took one shot in the fourth. You know, we kind of we went to Charles because you know he was our guy. And I think Jordan had twenty in the fourth quarter alone. So it was, uh, you know, but it's I, I I really I love those teams so much, and and you know Mahorn and the Johnny Dawkins obviously, Percy and, Hawkins, uh, Percy and Ron Anderson, and you know we we all I, I remain in very close touch with, uh, you know, with Charles, especially over this last year. Yeah. How was, how has he been? He seems like the kind of guy, you know, and that's the cool thing about rebound because you guys, you took a job back at rebound and that is an environment where, you know, Jason Williams, former NBA player, ran into some trouble, turned his life around. He, he started up this adventure therapy rehab and, Mm -hmm. You went down there about about a year ago, and there's the, the counselors, which I guess you are one now, or you, you're you're a coach, right? The guys who work there. Uh, yeah, I'm, um, my official title is peer mentor. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm somebody who's been through the program and helping people who are new to it, and you know, helping their transition. And then I sit in on on group therapy sessions every day for two hours. So it's it's been as beneficial to me as it is hopefully for you know everybody else. It's funny, right? They say that's when you get sober, you kind of give it away to keep it. And and being down there, I'm sure, is an environment where it and it reminds me. The reason I brought this whole thing up is because it reminds me of sports, the camaraderie. I mean, yep. the, that the sobriety for me. I'm I'm about ten years sober. Uh, it's been about the camaraderie. The, I never thought I'd find the same camaraderie I found in locker rooms, but. With sobriety, man, you talk about something that – you talk about a bond you share with people. Well, and, and Pete, you know, I, I, I knew I was in the right place. And it's, it's funny how life comes full circle that, you know, we had Jason as a rookie who went at the Sixers. And, um, you know, it's funny. He told me this story last year when I was here. And uh, his dad would come down to games during his rookie season. And about halfway through the year – he pulled Jason aside and he said, uh, you know, son said, why don't you stop hanging around with Barkley after the games and start hanging with G-Man? <laughs> 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 I just cracked up when he told me that story. No, but here it is all these years later. And, you know, we've made we remain in contact, but, you know, coming here and getting healthy and starting the journey really, it just made so much sense on so many levels for me. And talk about a cosmic deal. I mean, that's a guy that you mentored when he was yep. in the NBA. And just to bounce around a little bit, so you mentioned Charles over the past year. How has he helped you? He's been unbelievable. You know, he was um, – he and, uh, and his wife, Maureen, you know, were – they would call down here once a week to see how I was doing. They'd call Jason up and get up – you know, get updates. And it's just that they were – you know, the people down here, Sean, the thief and, and Jason, they were saying, we've never had as many calls about somebody here as we have with you. You know, Coach K at Duke wrote me a letter. Um, you know, all friends and from all walks of my life were calling to find out how I was. And that just gave me, you know, so much strength. It was unbelievable. That last year, when was when is your sobriety day? When did you show up there? Well, it's funny, though. A year ago today, I was driving down. Um, my my ex wife and my son were driving me down to detox, um, which I did in Boynton Beach, which is not too far away from 
where um, where rebound is. So today is July thirteenth. So this is I'm guessing this was the last day you drank. Yeah, I had a bottle of vodka in the back of the car, and they told me to drink on the way down because I was a high seizure risk. I was I had benzos and alcohol. So you know, I come stumbling out of the car, and Sean is waiting there. He catches me, and and Sean's you know, the guy who runs. Sean runs the place with Jason Williams, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and and I'm yeah, Sean the thief, and I've been working through, you know closely with both of them here, but I'm um. But you know they they got me into um, they got me into detox and I was such a high risk that they had uh, people they, I had somebody in my room twenty four seven for six days and then medical staff was checking me every four hours because I was a I was a fall down um, risk as well as a seizure risk. So, you know, my, and the detox normally takes seven days. Mine took 11. Um, and then I wound up, and I went to rebound after that for, I initially was going to go for 30 days, but we all felt that another 30 would be really beneficial. So I wound up staying for 60. Which is a great move. I mean, for me, I ended up going a long-term care. I went to a rehab called Karen in Pennsylvania and then went to, like like an extended care place, a halfway house after that, and and that to me was one of the biggest was one of the pivotal moments uh, because it's it's just another thirty days or another couple months for the rest of your life. Well, and, and you know, and it's it's funny you say that, and I look at that as, as probably the most beneficial of my stay. Um, you know, like I said, toward the end of that first thirty days, they said, you know you know, we think it would be, it would help you to stay longer. And I, I was really fortunate that, you know, my broadcasting season wasn't going on. So I could really concentrate and devote as much time as necessary to that process. And that extra 30 days was invaluable, Pete. I mean, it just really it set everything that I had done in the first 30 days really gave it a, a firm foundation. You know, nothing surprises me in sobriety, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But but I'll tell you, when I was watching the HBO Real Sports where they featured Jason Williams in Rebound and, and you appeared on the screen, I, w- I was surprised. And uh, mm-hmm. it's one of those, and I'm sure a lot of other people in your life, maybe from a distance or fans of yours, were surprised. I mean, I watch your work as an analyst um, with CBS and, and doing stuff with Raycom and the ACC and I knew your career as a player, and you were always, I think, polish is a word that people would associate with you. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I, I appreciate that, and but I, I just had, you know, life threw a bunch of haymakers at me. Um, the biggest one being the death of my fiance Sarah, uh, six years ago when she was 32 years old at the time. And I, that just put me over the top and uh, my drinking, I was, I was grieving and drinking and uh, I was able to function for a few years, but finally got to the point, especially the thing that put me over feet, like a lot of people in this country was COVID yeah. and uh, we had to stay in place in, in Charlotte and North Carolina. And I was basically in my apartment drinking and passing out and doing the same thing every day. Was your son Noah, does he live down in Charlotte or, or is he? Yeah, he was with me. He was living with me. He was in the front lines of all this. And he was the one who actually got the intervention that I, that I had that, you know, quote unquote, you know, moment of clarity. Yeah. And, uh, I, I had, I had friends about four years, got my teammates at Duke saw me and saw that, you know, they, they gave me some time to grieve, but then they also saw that I was really heading in a bad direction with my drinking. And they tried an intervention then. And I just, you know, I gave them the Heisman, this, you know, the stiff arm. And I sure. just said, look, I know there's something here, but I can handle this. You know, I mean, you, you know, all the, all the you know, all yeah. the, I just wasn't, I wasn't ready at that time. Uh, but something when Noah, it was a Zoom intervention. I was and, about to ask that, yeah. Yeah, it was a Zoom intervention. I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm drinking. And I got a vodka on the rocks and, a, and some water and I'm watching TV. And my son, they came walking in and they put the computer and said, Dad, we want to talk to you about something. And Sean and uh, another gentleman down here, Chris Penn, he was here at the time. 
did you led this intervention and started talking to me about rebound and pretty early on in the process I said, um, let's go, I'm in. Um and the thing that I did, which they said hardly ever happens, they've never seen it before. When I when I when that Zoom was over and my son Noah is like the weight of the world was taken off his shoulders. And I over the next couple of days, I called about 15 or 20 people that I was really close to and told them that I was coming down to, uh, to rebound, you know, to address this. And it, what that did is made me accountable. Yeah, right the accountability away. starts up early on. Yep. That, that somebody yep. who does that means business. Yep. And then they had, they had not heard of anybody doing that down a rebound. And then, you know, that, that, that you, you get the people who get the intervention and they say what people want to hear. And then, you know, all right, I'll be down the end of next week. And then the end of next week turns into the end of the month and, you know, on and on it goes. But I, I made, I made the decision and committed to it. As an elite athlete, you first team all American, you're seventh pick in the draft. And I've heard John Lucas say it's hard for elite athletes to admit that they can't conquer this, this liquid or these pills uh, it's almost an ego thing or a challenge thing. Did you suffer from that at all? Thinking I, I, I got this, I got this. I, you know, I played in the NBA for over a decade. 100%, 100%. And, uh, that was, you know, the, the reason I had the career that I did was, you know, I wasn't an overwhelming athlete or, you know, but, uh, it was my sheer, it was willpower and, and my belief in myself that allowed me to not only have that career, but then to go on and, you know, get to the network level on, on the TV side. And I just thought this, you know, I just thought, all right, I know I got an issue. I'm going to deal with it. And, uh, you know, life will go on. And, you know, that didn't happen. Let's go backwards. When you, when you're growing up, you grew up in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Was there any drinking as you started to excel on, on the high school level, you start to get recruited? Was there anything in high school that you look back on now with the knowledge you have with your issue? Oh, yeah. There was. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now I was, and, and it was, you know, we had a, it was a suburban slash rural area. Monroe, Connecticut was where I grew up and uh, just north of Bridgeport, um, in, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Fairfield County. Um, but I was, I was a freshman, um, starting on the varsity. So I was hanging around with the big boys and going to the same parties. And so I started drinking when I was 15 and started drinking beer and it was, you know, it was, it was at parties and on the weekend and stuff. And, and, you know, there were drugs at my high school, but to their credit, none of, nobody on the team ever pushed me to do any kind of even marijuana or anything like that. So, you know, it was, but I did start, you know, drinking beer at a very early age, but they saw you were special. So they said, Hey, can you stay away from this? You've got an opportunity to go to the next level. Yep. Yeah, really. And you know, I, I, I really, now I appreciate that more than ever and, and did for a long time looking back. Uh, you know, they had, they had the sense that I had an opportunity and a chance um, and I, I really appreciate that fact that there wasn't any peer pressure. Um, you know, even with the beer, I mean, it was just something that I did, but there was nothing any, you know, nothing with drugs or any of that, that, uh, you know, came from them. Do you remember that first time you had a drink? Oh, um, I remember, I mean, it's just, you know, growing up, I mean, I remember trying a beer you know, when I was younger than that and hating it. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to just be a social outcast, you know, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it just, I, I just kind of developed a taste for it. And, um, you know, we had a, we had a park, uh, near our, you know, that we used to go and play and it was lit at night. So we'd go and play and the liquor stores, they're closed at eight o'clock. So whoever was of age, uh, went down there, bought a couple of cases of beer, and uh, brought it back. And we just we finished playing, and sit around, and drinking beers in the parking lot. That was that was kind of it. Did you remember what it did for you? Did it, any, any kind of like crazy change at the time, or were you just doing what everybody else was doing? 
No, it was nothing changed. I um, I remember, I remember a couple of times of getting really drunk, but um, you know, aside from that, I, I really don't remember. You know, like sitting around thinking, man, I can't wait for this Saturday to come, and you know that type of thing. It's just something that, you know, I went to parties and you know people had kegs and or you know whatever, and uh, didn't. Never drank any hard liquor, no wine, um, just, you know, strictly beer. And that was, that was pretty much through Duke and even early on into the pros. Too. How did you, how did you end up at Duke? I, it's a weird story. I was one, I, I was ahead of my time. I actually reclassified. I was supposed to graduate in 77, but the league I was playing in was not that challenging. And then I was, you know, I averaged 30 points a game as a sophomore and 41 points a game as a junior. Jeez. And, um, I, you know, at the end of my sophomore year, I was like, you know, I can graduate because I had some credits that I pulled from eighth grade that were applied to, you know, to high school. And so it wasn't that hard. And there were other kids who actually did that as well at my school. And I just said, you know, I'm, I need to do this for, you know, for my career. And I felt fine with it academically. Socially, it was a little bit of a stretch, but because I was younger anyway. But, um, you know, I was, I was getting recruited, and it's completely different back then. And, you know, usually it was your senior going the summer before your senior year and then going into your senior year that you really kind of hit everybody's radar. And, I had I kind of let schools know that the ones that I wanted to go to that I was doing this, and Maryland was one of them. And when I was down in Maryland, they had a guy from Duke uh, named Terry Chili, who was working as a counselor there. And he started. He came over. He saw me playing. And this is like a basketball uh, camp. Yeah, it's a basketball. Maryland's yeah. basketball camp. And. So he starts chatting Duke up, and I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll, you know, I'd love to. Thought, you know, you seem like a good guy. And um, so, you know, one thing led to another, and I, I fell in love with the, the school on my visit and called everybody else. And I first I called the coaching staff, and I said, I, you know, uh, I'd like to commit if you all want to give me a scholarship. And so they did, and they committed to me. And um, <laughs> the funny side story is that Lefty Drizel never had another player from the ACC work at his camp <laughs> after that. <laughs> yeah. so, so it was it was it was weird. It was weird, but it was certainly I I knew from when I the moment I stepped on campus that that's where I was going to go. And, and Duke was not the the, the monster. It is today. Duke basketball was not. Was Coach K still at Army, or was he? At, he wasn't at yes, Duke. Yes. No. Yeah. No. Well, he. Yeah. He was still at Army, and Bill Foster was was my coach, and <clears throat> he um, he was known as a builder of programs. He had gone out to Utah and built that program up in the early seventies, and um, you know, the, in the in the sixties, Duke was. They went to the Final Four four times. A, a gentleman named Vic Bupis was coach who was an you know incredible coach and really kind of overlooked and uh, underrated and coach you know then things kind of hit the skids when he left and coach foster was building it back up um and you know they they signed jimmy spinarkle the year before me and then they signed me and then they got gene banks the next year yeah and those were the three recruiting classes that that got us back yeah those are some heavy hitters well, you know, Gene, you know, with his, you know, he he was the greatest player next to Will Chamberlain that came out of Philadelphia up to that time. And, uh, it was a, it was a huge coup for, for Duke to recruit him. And he, you know, looking back on it now, Pete, it's, it's amazing that it's 1978 and he was really the first important superstar black athlete that Duke ever recruited. So it was it was really a cultural, you know, milestone in a lot of ways, and um, you know, and that just and he and Kenny Denard came in in the same class, and uh, Bob Bender transferred from Indiana, and John Harrell transferred from North Carolina Central right there, and that was the core of our team. And you guys start to build something there. 
you know, on the floor, off the court, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what is it like? Just you, you're just having a couple beers. You're just kind of like, you know, celebrating. Yeah, I, I was, I was, I joined a fraternity. I was uh, an SAE, and um, you know, we had, you know, we had cake parties and socials and functions, and uh, you know, again, it was not everyday drinking. It was just, you know, situational and parties, and you know, I. I calm things down, obviously, during the season. Yeah, so clearly it's not uh, affecting your performance. And is it no. affecting relationships at all with people? No, not a bit. Not a bit at that time. And uh, and, and that's why, you know, I, yeah, our, were there flags? There was, you know, I had alcoholism on, on, in my family and in the, you know, in, in the family history. So, you know, that was certainly there. And, but it never, you know, through my, through my college days and through my pro days, I mean, it was just never an issue. I wasn't, you know, I was, um, I'm probably more than a social drinker, but it certainly was not a problem when I was in the league ever. Well, and unfortunately that was a rough time for the league. When you entered the NBA, was it 1980? Uh, 1980, yeah. So you're on, you're, you're on, are you on the Nets team with, with Michael Ray Richardson? Yeah, so oh yeah, I was front and center for for that whole thing, and um, share to share you know, share what that was like. I mean, this guy is one of the best players we've seen at that time, but he off the court, you know, the cocaine thing is just starting to yeah. gain yep. momentum, and uh, his life goes off the tracks. Well, and you know, and it was it was actually it was it, it was coming down a little bit. David Stern became the commissioner in '83, I think, and he. He really kind of turned things around. <clears throat> you know, certainly the league benefited from Magic and Bird coming in. And, you know, Doc, Dr. J was at the end of his career, but still really markable. And um, Jordan comes in in 84 along with Charles. And, you know, so the, the drug culture of the 70s was on the wane, but still had, you know, there were some prominent people who were involved. And Michael Ray was, I tell people when he was when he was straight when he was clean, one of the top three guards in the in the in the league, without a doubt. And I, I remember we were I forget which year it was we had the sixth best record in the league, and we had a Christmas party, and <clears throat> after the party, Michael Michael Ray went missing. And gentleman in the front office for the Nets kind of knew where his hangouts were. He went to this crack house in, in New York City and found him. He had been up for 48 hours straight, um, you know, went right into rehab after that. And we, we tanked. The season went south, you know, not long after that. But he was such a gifted player uh, and a good guy, basically. And he's, he's gotten his life turned around and he's, you know, he's clean right now, as far as I know. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. I mean, and it's, you know, he was a good guy. A lot of us are, Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. you just got this, you got this, this, this thing, this monkey on your back that, that you can't shake until you admit that, you know, it's something you need help with. What, what, what was that like for you to enter the NBA during a time like that? Yeah. The, uh, and the culture wasn't, um, that overwhelming because I wasn't predisposed to drugs. Um, you know, again, it was mostly beer at that point. And, uh, I, I was, I struggled my first, um, my first few years in the league just because physically I was not close to where I needed to be. To like, compete, bu like bulk you know? wise, right? Yeah. Yeah. Strength bulk. Like, you know, cause like I went from college to playing against grown men. Yeah. And you know, like I'm, that that was back in the era when centers actually existed. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm playing against. Well, I'm playing. I'm playing against Dave Cowens and Wes Unseld and Bob Lanier and Kareem Moses and Parrish and Moses. And, you know, you go right on down the list, and you know it was a it was a bitch every night. And you know, you go from you go from that uh, college season to eighty two games and uh my rookie year I wound up having surgery after fifty something games and got shut down. But it, it took me until the end of my third year before I really felt comfortable. What was it like flying commercial being such being six <laughs> eleven? 
Well, what they used to do was uh, the, the schedule would come out, and it, it was bare bones. I mean, we had a trainer. We, di- we didn't have I'll, – I'll show my age here. He, when we went on a road trip, we would, like if it was a long – like six games or so, we'd get two sets of uniforms. And we were – we had no equipment manager, uh, and we were, in, we were supposed to wash our – you know, play a game – wash the uniform that night after the game, hang it up in the bathroom, go on to the next place, wear a clean uniform, and then wait for that one to dry out. <laughs> and some of the guys weren't diligent in their uh, washing of their uniform. You had to so wash they, them? Well, yeah, we had to wash them in the sink in our hotel room. <laughs> or take a shower in them, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> and... Traveling commercially was a trip. So anyway, with the, with regard to the airlines, that the trainer was also booked all the flights. So he would meet with the coach, and they'd talk about where they would, you know, they'd look at the schedule and say, all right, we need we need flights here, here, here. You know, just go through a whole year. And he would go to his travel agent, and they'd buy tickets then. They'd buy all the first-class seats that were available, and – if that number didn't add up to 12, then it went by seniority who sat up front and, you know, the rookies sat in the back. And what they did was in a, they'd buy a row with three seats in it and they'd buy all three seats, but they'd only put two of us in a row. Okay. And, and we'd kind of angle in and, you know, try to fall asleep on that trip because the, the rule was if you were playing a back to back game, that you had to take the first available flight out to the, your next city. Yeah, I you know it's and, funny. I used to I, I heard that they did that because of some of the stuff that was going on in the in the eighties. I remember hearing that Bernie Bickerstaff said that, <laughs> and I remember he mentioned that that the play was so poor that that morning you took off and you played a noon game. Guys would play terrible. Well, here's and this is you know if you were a bookie and you had any sense at all, you looked at the schedule. You know these you could cherry pick. The the worst one that I had that I remember was uh, my rookie year. We played the we played the Lakers, and that that fresh uh, my rookie year we played down in Piscataway while the while the arena was being built in Jersey. In okay, yeah, yeah. So we're playing down at the rack, and we where Rutgers is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we 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 play the Lakers, and we get up the next morning, fly up to Detroit and then play Detroit on Saturday night. And then we get up and fly to Washington and play the Bullets at 1 o'clock. Oh. So we get, into, we get into National and we bus out to the Cap Center and we fall asleep. everybody falls asleep on the locker room floor and takes a nap. Uh, you know, we got up, took showers, and went out and got drilled by like 40 points, something like that. Clearly, for you, it wasn't kind of a, a huge issue at the time. But some of the guys are partying and drinking and, and doing drugs, and it's like it, it's just sloppy play. People, the, the the product was really poor. Yeah, and I I think that and Stern saw that, and I think they did away with the three games in three days that next year, or not long after that. And that was that was just a brutal thing, especially having to fly commercially and. You know, fast forward, and we're talking about my time with the Sixers. Well, the the Pistons were on the; they were the very first team that um, that chartered, and that was such a huge advantage over everybody else, and that really helped them in those back-to-back championship years. Is, was there any drinking on the commercial flights? Um, yeah, first class. You know, you'd have. I remember <laughs> we, we had our our trainer. Um, with uh, with the Nets, Fritz Massman was like my second father during my early years there, and uh, you know he he used to drink. He'd have Cape Cod, he'd call you know the vodka and cranberry juice. And we had some guys in, up in who sit in front of class who didn't drink, but they would always get um, the little airplane bottles of vodka and put them in the air sick bags. And if we was a long flight, we'd run them back to Fritz, and he would have the cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that was, that was the funny side story of that, but I, I don't ever remember anybody really getting torn up on a, you know, on a flight out to, uh, you know, from this, 
if it was going to happen, it would have been out if we were going out to the West Coast. Yeah. So how how was it? Excuse me. When you get to the Sixers and you're you're mentoring a guy like Jason Williams, you got guys like Rick Mahorn and Bar- you got these big personalities, uh, guys that like to have fun. What was that experience like? It was the best. I mean, I you know Charles Charlie he tested me early and I kind of went right back at him and you know we that was a team that bonded really quickly and Mahorn was a big part of that as well and that those teams probably as closely you know mimicked my my Duke teams as far as relationships were concerned. Um, you know, I have some great, I have great friends in, in Jersey and Michael Korn and I are still dear friends and Buck Williams. who I've talked to, he, he saw the feature on HBO and he reached out to me to, you know, he just wanted to make sure I was doing well. And, Buck was so underrated. You know, so underrated. He was, and just an awesome teammate and an awesome guy. And, you know, it was so good to catch up with him. Uh, Albert King was wonderful to play with. Uh, we had good guys on that team. We just, you know, we had, we had our super, you know, and after Michael Ray left, it was Orlando Woolrich who had problems, you know, with, with cocaine. And, um, he was our best player, you know, at, during that time and just always got sabotaged by that. Um, but, uh, the Philly teams were, you know, were awesome and winning that, you know, you talked about that year winning the, the uh, Atlantic. Atlantic division. It was really special. So wh- when did it for, for you, when did the alcoholism start to start to kick off? I mean, you get, you get out of the league. You mentioned it really wasn't a problem in the league. And afterwards, when did you start to notice? W- was it with the death of your fiance that you really start? Or yeah. Was it leading up to that at all? Yeah, I was, I mean, you know, and the broadcasting industry has had a lot of casualties and, uh, you know, with regard to addiction and alcoholism, and uh, it's just very conducive to that. And going after, going out after the game, and you know, it's like you tell people, it's you know, you do a seven thirty game or an eight o'clock game, and you're not done till ten, and you're still really wired and on, and you go out and have a few cocktails to kind of come down and unwind. Yeah, and you develop close and, relationships with the guys you're doing <clears throat> games with, and you're on the road. With. Yeah. Yeah, you know, your producer, director, I mean, you know, the, and yeah. the crew goes out and, you you know, you find a place to go get a bite to eat and have some cocktails. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I, I guess, and, and things with me, it was, I, I guess people, would, again, would look at my drinking during that time before, um, you know, before I met Sarah and say, yeah, he probably drinks a lot. But I didn't, you know, again, it never, it never affected my broadcasting, never affected relationships, never affected anything. But that her death was so traumatic to me that I just, I couldn't cope. I I just, that was the last thing in a series of things that life threw at me that I just, I just threw my hands up and, and could not deal with it. And the only way that I chose to deal with it was to start drinking even more. And so you're 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 isolating, right? You're living you're living oh, yeah. in Charlotte, and you're just drinking. I mean, you mentioned once COVID hit, you just drank and passed out and drank and passed out. Before that, before COVID hit, what was the drinking like? Like a- after she dies, was it still extremely problematic? People were yeah, noticing. Yeah, yeah. There was a um, there was a uh, our coach Foster passed away. And they had a, um, you know, we had a celebration of his life up in Rutgers, as a matter of fact. And just about all of that 78 team came back. And I was, I was, I was a mess then. And they could see, you know, I was bloated. Uh, my face was red. I mean, I was just, you know, people are ordering drinks and I'm ordering doubles and finishing them faster than anybody's finishing their drink. So... You know, it just, it, it really did. That that was the onset of the really, the spiral downward. And it, it really, uh, you know, that in combination with the, the benzos, um, you know, that's, as I found out later, that's one of the toughest things to detox. How, how did you, and, how did you get started on those? Well, just the Xanax was, I was getting panic attacks. Uh-huh. And I was, um, 
you know, I was prescribed then. I never really took massive amounts of it. Um, but, you know, obviously there's the warning on it, do not drink alcohol in conjunction yeah. with this. And, I, you know, I blew that out of the water. And, you know, it got to the point where I was, I was over a fifth of vodka a day. And, you know, that combined with, um, you know, with the Xanax is I, I just would have this bone crushing depression at night and would wake up the next day. And the only way that I knew to get out of it was to start drinking again, you know, right at breakfast. You never struggled with calling a game? No, no. Well, it, it just, I made it through that last year before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And, but as, like I said, the, the stay in place literally happened three days after the season was over. Yeah. And I, you know, the stay in place started three days after that. And as that month went by and, you know, into, in the, as March went by and then into April, I, you know, I, I became, I, I knew that I was not going to be able to broadcast that next year. Um, I didn't know if I was going to be able to function that next year. And at that point, it's so far down the road, you don't care really, right? Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, I was, I, I was to the point where for, uh, you know, my own inability to ask for help, but with all the events that transpired with that intervention, I just, I was desperately hoping that somebody was going to help me just, you know, push me in the right direction or kick, you know, kick me in the butt in the right direction. And that's, that's basically what happened. As an athlete, as a competitor, how much did it mean to you when you get the intervention and it's, and it's Jason Williams uh, and he says, you know, you're going to come down here with me. And I would imagine that that maybe hits you in a different way as opposed to having some therapist you, you've never met before at, at a rehab I, you're totally unfamiliar with. Pete, it was amazing how, I mean, when, when that Zoom call happened, this amazing um, sense of calm and peace came over me. And, and just knowing that, he was he was going to be there to greet me and get me through this, and then the other the other thing and these things kept on happening. Like when I got down here, I was seeing a, a physical therapist, and the guy who I wound up seeing was a trainer uh, for the Knicks for years. His name is Mike Saunders, and you know that just I, I knew Mike from the early eighties. Yeah. And all these people kept popping up in my initial part of my recovery. And it was like God just put all these things right in place for me. The all new Chevy Colorado is made for more. Stacked with the latest in vehicle technologies like a class leading 11 inch diagonal center touchscreen and an extra large wireless charging pad. Plus, it features wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto compatibility to make staying connected easy wherever your adventure takes you. Chevy Colorado, made for more. Learn more at Chevrolet.com slash truck slash Colorado. Claims based on latest competitive data. And so you get down to rebound now, and, and, it's, and it's adventure therapy. <clears throat> How the heck, how does that grab you? I mean, you're six eleven. You're, you're 60, you're 60 years old, right? You're getting sober and it's like, yeah. okay, now Jason Williams wants me to jump out of a plane. Well, the, the, the funny part was that, um, during the interview, they were, you know, Sean and Chris were explaining what adventure therapy was all about and Jason and, you know, they're saying, well, one of the things we do is go skydiving. And I like, perked up and I said there's no effing way that I'm jumping out of a plane ever so just put that aside so you know we went through that whole first 30 days and then I committed to the next 30 days about middle of that they said all right we're gonna take a drive I'm like all right fine and then he I said where are we going and he goes well, we're going out to the airport I knew what was happening and at that point I just said I was I was in the point of my recovery 
where I said, all right, I'm, I'm all right with this. Let's go. And that's what starts to happen, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm, so I get in the, I get in the plane. I'm meeting the, I meet the guy who I'm buddy jumping with. Who's awesome. He had like 22,000 jumps in his life. Okay. And made me feel really at ease. So we're getting in this plane and we're circling up and we go to about 11,000, 12,000 feet and the door of this thing opens up and then he says, all right, let's, you know, get out on the little ledge there and get out and off we go. And I just, you know, the, the free fall was a little, you know, I've got to, I'm not lying. I was the happiest guy in the world when the shoot opened. <laughs> but then that, that sense that is really peaceful. I just caught myself looking around and saying, man, this is really cool. You know, just kind of floating down and, you know, we landed and I, I hit the ground and Jason came over and we, gave, we each gave each other a huge hug. And I, Pete, I, it gave me the sense like I could do anything, you know, and, and that's exactly what these things down here are supposed to do for people to get you outside of your comfort zone, do things that you normally wouldn't do, and just see what the possibilities are. And sometimes and it, it takes a minute, right? It takes 45 days or whatever, but when you're ready, you know, um, it, it's a game changer. Well, and <laughs> when I, when I got in the plane and we're circling up, I knew I because when at the moment before you get out the side door to jump out, you got to give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And I was like, I was like, we were close to getting where we're, you know, the drop point. And I was like, you know, there's no way I'm going to land with this plane. <laughs> 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 I just wasn't going to do that. And, uh, so like I said, off we went and, um, and he, you know, the whole rest of the time I was down here and even, even today, like I'll, I'll look up at the clouds and go, man, you know what? I was up there and we, we went skydiving and you know, it's just a, a just a cool memory. And I, I do it again in a heartbeat. Absolutely. Walk me through a day down there. You know, you show up there. And, and what, what started to work for you? I mean, because it's a whole new way of life. I mean, you're like, a, I was like a raw nerve. Uh, and, and you're somewhere where you just kind of turn it all over. What was that? What was that like for you on a day to day basis? Well, the, you know, th throughout the detox again, because of my, you know, the seizure risk and all those things, I was, I was medicated through all of that and thank, you know, there's yeah. no way. You know, if truly, if if I tried to white knuckle it, I, there was a fifty fifty chance that I would have died. Yeah, I mean that's why they have doctors. They put you on those tapers, and yep. that, there's a real good reason yep. for that. Yep, and I knew that I I knew I couldn't just stop in my you know in in my apartment and say all right I'm stop I'm finishing drinking right now. I knew I had to be in a facility like that, and um, and so I I go down there and I'm and um. They're, you know, I'm taking sleep meds to get some rest at night. So I go through my detox and I go and Jason comes and they pick me up. And, um, so I go out to, I come out to rebound and I don't have my sleep meds. So for the first four days, first four nights that I was here, I got four hours of sleep total. Wow. I got two nights of no sleep, one night of one hour, and then one night of three hours. And I started hallucinating. Um, there was, there was one night, I swear to God, I looked, I was in, I was trying to sleep and I looked over and Sarah was right next to me in bed. That's your and fiance I, who passed away. Yes. And I, I tried to reach and I couldn't touch her obviously, but she was as real as if she were alive. And, and then I was, I was hearing music in my head. Um, which talking to some people, that's not an uncommon thing either. Uh, but I was like pulling people up who were in rebound and say, Hey, you got to come up to my room and hear this music. And they'd come up and look at me like I had, you know, two heads. Yeah. Um, but I just had, you know, I had visions, hallucinations, all this stuff. And so finally I got on some sleep meds and, um, got into the rhythm of the program, but it's get up at six 30 in the morning. Uh, we go have breakfast. We go to the gym and uh, work out for an hour, hour and a half, and then 
go to whatever adventure therapy, um, you know, do, they do wave runners. We have, you know, there's golf, there's driving ranges, there's bowling, there's, you know, skydiving, there's horseback riding, um, you know, a whole list of things. And I guess you got to, I'm guessing, just to cut you off, you got to kind of learn how to fail in sobriety too. Somebody that's been so successful like you, because I would imagine, you know, 10 days off all the stuff, you know, the, the, the benzos and the alcohol, you, you're, you're probably not hitting a, you know, hitting it right down the fairway. You know, and if from that, from my, you know, my life drinking, I, I never got up at six thirty. you know, I can't, yeah. I went to bed close, closer to it on the other end than I did getting up like that. You know, so that regimentation was, it took me a while to get in line with. And, um, but then, you know, I started working out and I, the weight started to fall off me and I was so tired by the end of the day because your day, you know, afternoons or individual sessions or group sessions of therapy. And they take a lot um, out of you. Yeah, because you're, you know, and I opened up like I never had before in my life. And those, they get, it's pretty raw. I mean, you've been through it. It's, yeah. it's tired, you know, it's tiring. And, um, you know, so by the end of the day, you're ready to go to sleep, and that's the uh, that's the other thing. I mean, you're you're going from six thirty until you know eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, and then you're ready to go to sleep. Some of the other staffers that are there, uh, you know, f- former athletes <clears throat> like you, a guy like Jason, when they yeah. when they exhibit that vulnerability. I mean, and, and, and then you follow suit. That's got to be kind of amazing because we're talking about two guys. Uh, you know, you could play 12, 15 years in the NBA with somebody alongside him, and you're not going to get that vulnerability as you, you're going to get like 48 hours into a treatment center with someone. I got to imagine that's quite the step. Yeah, because I, I, you know, and it, of course, when I first started playing, that social media didn't exist, none of that stuff existed. And, you know, that became more prevalent as I was in my broadcasting. You know, this would be my 27th year coming up broadcasting. So I really came into it from that side. But, you know, you're in front of the camera and you're you're doing some national stuff and your life is out there. And then all of a sudden you can Google my name and find out everything you need to know about me. So... You know, through in, in the cocoon here in the group sessions at Rebound, I, I, you know, I felt completely safe of opening up everything. And then just got to be real comfortable with that. And probably the defining moment for me after leaving Rebound was, you know, I went, I had outpatient in Charlotte that I did from September until February of this year. And that, that um, that HBO feature was really liberating for me. It yeah, was I was about to that, ask you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was the first time that I'd I'd been I'd, I'd said anything publicly about what I had been through in the last year. For me, even you know, I'm not Mike Jaminski, but I'm down here in Texas. I'm a news anchor, and I was like a little antsy and a little worried about um, coming out and. Th- telling people what my deal was because you just have, you know, you have fears, whatever you're in your head about it. And, uh, mm-hmm. man, to be able to come out and just let go and let people see it for what it is. Like you said, it's, it's extremely liberating. And then, you know, a guy like you, Mike, you, you help other people. I mean, you helped me that day. I saw that here's a guy who, again, it, if it can happen to you, it can happen to anybody is the kind of approach I mm-hmm. took when I saw it. And, uh, it really gave me a shot in the arm. It really did. I mean, so you, you are, you know, I'm sure you got tons of feedback. Well, just in hearing you say that it makes me smile. I, it, and that's the the whole thing. And, you know, this, me coming down here to rebound, it, it started to formulate probably as that whole process with, you know, Jason called me up and asked me to be a part of, you know, that feature. And I said, absolutely. And, um, and it's funny. I had like, five or six people that I, you know, my close friends who still check in on me, you know, every couple of weeks to see how I'm doing. And, um, without me even saying anything about that, they said, you know, I really envision you being, uh, using your platform to help people going forward. And that just clicked with me with what I was thinking already, you know? And, um, then this, the whole thing came together with me working down here, but, I've been 
really at ease uh, doing things like this, um, speaking, you know, on behalf of rebound or just being transparent. It's been, it's, it's been empowering to me really. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, it gives you that feeling in my experience, the more you are open with, with, with your situation and helping other people. For me, it gives me the feeling that alcohol used to give me to a degree, you know, it gives me that rush. It gives, okay, I feel good. You know, it, it fills that, it fills me up uh, and it works. And, you know, and, and for me, being down here and um, being in this environment, being around people who are, you know, doing it one day at a time, and me sitting through these therapy sessions as a, a facilitator now, um, it, that does as much for me as it does, I hope, for the people that are in the program for the first time or, you know, or a second time. And so I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's really the, you know, it's a win-win for me and, um, you know, something that I can see myself doing for a long, long time. I mean, it's not, it's not often at 60, you know, now one that you get something new and fresh in your life that really energizes you. And this certainly has done that. What do you tell somebody who, who shows up down there and doesn't believe that they can get it or they can do it? How, what what kind of uh, experience, strength, and hope do you pass along? I just I think that people may be shocked that I'm as open and transparent as I am, and I don't do it for any other reason than to, you know, there there's no cookie cutter for this, I and mean, you know, you have your journey, I have mine, everybody has their own there are things that resonate with all of us. There are, you know, some things that resonate more strongly. And the only, the, the biggest thing that I can do for you is just be honest and open and be myself and talk about my experience. And if there's something, there's more than a few things that click, you know, that's awesome. But I think they see the, the way that I'm approaching this, you know, the program and how I work rebound every single day of my life that, you know, they see that I have success, maybe something that works for them. Can anybody go to rehome, Rebound, or is it like, uh, is it like uh, that That just hit me. Like, can, can anyone go there? Or? It's it's pretty, they, they like to keep it small. Uh, there's really, there's never more than uh, four or five people here at one time. So it, it's not a huge <sighs> thing, a huge population of people but that's the that's what makes this special yeah, and yeah. That it's very intimate everybody gets really you know really close attention and um you know we have a thing to, as alumni of you go through the program you become part of a uh, marco polo group and we're on that every single day um it's a way to keep all of us accountable to each other you know we can we know if somebody misses four or five days in a row of that, that something's up and, you know, we, we address that and try to help them the best we can. But it's, it's really like, uh, you know, it's just, it's another form of, again, all of us holding each other accountable and we've all been through the program. We've all had the same shared experience. Any, for you, any other type of like 12 step work or, or therapy or just, you know, it's, it's rebound full time in your parcel in the broadcasting. Yeah, I didn't. Um, I, I, I have gone to, um, I have gone to AA and, um, uh, matter of fact, I mean, tomorrow, tomorrow is actually my one year, uh, date of, uh, one year anniversary of sobriety. So I'm going to go, um, with, with the group here, um, you know, for that. Uh, but this uh, really those my, those therapy sh- sessions in the afternoon for me um, have been you know really the biggest part of my recovery. You go to you go back to work. I mean, talk about they were so accepting. You leave Rebound and and you're back on the air, uh, broadcasting on on a national stage doing ACC games. How are they at work? I mean, just to welcome uh, you back. My biggest fans my biggest supporters. I mean, I'm just so fortunate that the, you know, the coordinating producers of the entities that I work with, they what knew what are we talking what about? C- uh, like CBS? Is it, is it still Raycom? It was 
it's, it's really, well, it's, it's now, it's great. It's, it's, it's great television. We work for the same yeah. company. It's great. To, yeah, yeah, my yeah, station's owned yeah. by, yeah, so it is. So it used to be Raycom, and now it's gray. Okay. And, and then, you know, Fox Sports got bought by Bally, so. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's hard to keep you know, score. Yeah, yeah. It just, um, but the same people have been in place, and they've been my biggest supporters. And, I, you know, I couldn't ask for a better situation, you know, Tim Brando, who I've probably worked with more nationally than anybody, he texted me and checked in on me the whole time I was here last year in the program and, you know, keeps up with me. And, uh, you know, the people at work have been awesome. Every, everybody has been. I've been so blessed with the people. No, nobody, has, nobody has cut and run or divorced themselves from me at all. Um, in fact, they've been they've been so thrilled about my recovery, even maybe as much as I am. Um, I guess I, it's funny. I had one of the um, one of the therapists who I was doing outpatient with. You know, she was curious about you know watching because she you know like when I was doing that, it was during last season, and uh, and she went back and she Googled uh, or YouTube the game for me a couple of years before. And she looked at me, she goes, I didn't even recognize you wow. when you were out in the air. And, uh, you know, it was really wonderful for me to go through last season with a, with a clear head and, uh, you know, a sense of purpose. And, um, so I'm, you know, I'd like to do that as, as long as I can, but it's also wonderful. Um, you know, I'm thinking about relocating down here to Florida. That was my next, next question. Do you, do you think you're going to stay down there and work, work at rebound full time or I'd like to, you know, where this was, I don't know how either one of us knew how this was going to go, but I think everybody is, is really happy with, you know, I've been here two months already and been happy with the results to, you know, to this point and, you know, I'd, I'd like to commit to them going forward. And what I'd like to do is, is, you know, relocate down here because uh, from the airport here, they have. Where exactly? What, city, what city is it in, Mike? Um, we're in Lake Worth right now, which is not too far from West Palm Beach and okay. Palm Beach. And we are physically, as the crow flies, probably 65, mm-hmm. 70 miles north of Miami. Um, inland a little bit from the coat, from the, from the beach, but not that far. Um, it's a beautiful, it's an eight acre of a state out here. And there's a, there's a guest house and the five bedrooms in the main house. And I'm staying in one of those. I'm on site 24 seven. Um, so I would, you know, I'd get a place down here and, uh, there's flights every day to Atlanta and to Charlotte. So I can connect and do my broadcasting from here just as easy. Yeah. And then I'd commit to more time here at at Rebound. You know, I could do it from April until November and then do my broadcasting. And are you going to be broadcasting from those studios in Atlanta and Charlotte this year? Or do you think you'll be back out on the road? No, you know what? Throughout last year, I was at every arena that I didn't, I did not do a remote game one time. Wow. Yeah. How about that? That's awesome. Um, so we were we went to the arena and you know we were sitting up in the upper deck or wherever they put us to remotely get us away from the floor. But uh, yeah, we were actually in the building. I never I've never had to do a game sitting in front of a monitor in a studio somewhere. Wow. Yeah, and it's funny, right? You're one of the few now uh, that that yep. the on the opposite end of that. Yeah. No. I mean, like everybody's done. You know they. ESPN is, I think they've wired stuff into people's homes. Yeah. I mean, I know country. guys that have, I've worked with guys. I do, I do spotting for football sometimes and I do some baseball myself. Um, the baseball, you get to go there uh, in person, but some of the football, they would send the spotter. I, I would do it on, on site and you know, the broadcasters are back home. Uh, yep. and, and I think we'll, I think we'll see more of that too. It, it's interesting to see what, what, what will develop going forward. That's cool that, uh, that you were on site for those games. Last thing, where can people find you? Any, any, any like way people, if they want you to speak, um, they can locate you or is it just get in touch with rebound and go from there? Um, no, I mean, I, they can, um, I'm on Facebook. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. There we go. Look at this. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, what's, Um, what's, what's, what's your Instagram? 
Uh, it's, it's just at Mike Jaminski. Okay, there you go. Yeah, it's just Mike Jaminski. My, all my stuff will, uh, you know, I, I'll pop up anywhere you want to look on those three, and uh, then you can, you know, you can DM me, and um, you know, I'll get back to you. But um, yeah, no, that'd be, you know, I love to, I love to go out and speak and talk about rebound and talk about my journey, and uh, um, you know, that, that's, I think that's my calling going forward. I mean, you're certainly good at it, and it certainly is inspiring. And uh, you know, it's kind of a, a fateful thing that I was able to get in touch with Jill, or and 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 seeing you on on Real Sports is just such a, such a shot in the arm for people that are, you know, because some, you know, that day maybe I was having a rough day, and I saw you, and I was like, wow, you know, and that's how this thing works. So I appreciate what you're doing so much, Mike, and uh, you know, I thank you so much for taking the time with me. I don't know what I did. I guess that was it, huh? We wrapped up. It was perfect timing, huh? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But, um, no, I mean, Jill, you know, and her story. And, um, I mean, I, you know, Pete, I've had, I had, I've had a bunch of people come up to me just when I was in Charlotte before coming down here saying, Hey, I saw the feature and you were, you know, what a great thing that you did. And, or they'd come up and say, we have a family member who's having issues and wanted some counseling for the, you know, themselves. So it's, it's been really powerful for me. Yeah. It's a big, it's a big deal, Mike. So, I mean like the, you know, and there's a stigma to, to addiction that, you know, you can help snap off, which, so it's great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, that, I mean, I, I can't control how people feel. So, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't worry about that. And, uh, all I can, all I can be is honest going forward. And, uh, you know, just, the one, the one day at a time has really worked for me. Uh, and it, it's amazing how fast the year has gone by. And I, I, you know, for anybody who says miracles don't happen, I look where I was a year and a month ago. Um, and I was a, I was a mess and here I am working at this place, you know? Yeah. I mean, Jason Williams, I saw him say, you know, he, he, he wasn't sure that you were going to make it once you showed up there. Yep. Yeah. I was a hot steaming mess when I fell out of the back of that car and I got down here. (laughs) That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, you're not anymore. That's, that's for sure. Uh, this'll, this'll go up, uh, on all the platforms on Thursday, but I'll send you a link to it. Um, okay. Yeah. Sounds awesome. Yeah. You're the man, Mike. I can't thank you enough, dude. Thanks so much for listening to the payoff with Pete. Once again, I'm Pete Souza. And of course we are part of the rogue media network, all kinds of good podcasts. You can find at roguemedianetwork.com. And of course you can find this podcast and all those other ones, wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, other spots like that. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast.